two households both alike in dignity, and fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. And of course, those are the opening lines to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. However, in 1692, in Salem, Massachusetts, two households, both alike in dignity, through their mutiny and their petty rivalry, ended up causing the Salem witch trials. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we seriously would not be able to run this channel. You guys are the true rock stars and the ones who are able to provide me with the resources to continue to explore and research these interesting topics. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on part one of the Salem Witch Trials, we are going to be talking about the official narrative. The Salem Witch Trials of 1692 in some circles are thought to be one of the biggest government cover-ups because there was a time in our American history where books written on the Salem Witch Trials were burned. It is said that during this time of 1692, people from all over the colonies traveled to Salem to basically watch the shit show that was the Witch Trials. During the hysteria of the Salem witch trials, more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft, 30 were found guilty, 19 were executed by hanging, 14 women and 5 men, 5 died in jail, and one very poor man, a man named Giles Corey, was pressed to death for refusing to plead. For many scholars, this is now seen to be a case of mass hysteria one that was instigated by teenage girls and propagated by grown-ass men who had a rivalry against each other. The Salem Witch Trials were coming on the heels of the witch trials that had previously happened over in Europe. We know King James, who is responsible for the King James Bible and was himself openly a Satanist, loved his witch trials. He loved to see women suffer in their grueling executions for things that they were not guilty of. So, of course, it wouldn't be long before the sensation of accusing people you don't like as being witches would make its way over to the quote-unquote new world. Because if there's anything that the Salem witch trials taught us, it's that, quote, to accuse someone of witchcraft was to take power over them. English colonists began settling the area of Salem, Massachusetts in 1626. Very quickly, Salem became one of the most important seaports in the colonies. And from 1630 to 1691, Salem was under the jurisdiction of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This was essentially a corporation, a company that was there to manage the new colonists and reasonably so because this area of the world became economically successful in its trade with England, Mexico, and the West Indies. And a lot like how they tell us the city of New Orleans was settled, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was set up as a business to also lure new settlers into the area. And it was successful because at this time, it got about 20,000 colonists to emigrate over from the United Kingdom to the newfound colonies that would essentially become the United States of America. The colonists didn't have a lot of trouble with the natives because from the years 1617 to 1618, many of the natives were wiped out by smallpox. Now, like the witch trials, I have my suspicions about what this really was, but of course, we'll be getting into that into part two. Many of the settlers to Salem were Puritans. Puritans were English Protestants that essentially were not happy with the Church of England. They thought the Church of England was a little bit too Catholic. They advocated for purity of worship and basically piety in all 
fractions of life. Now, the hysteria of the witch trials took place in an area called Salem Village. This was a small community a few miles outside of Salem Town. However, as we'll see, Salem Village did not actually have its own government system. Now, please remember at this time, according to the official narrative, the colonies were not their own country. They were still technically governed by the Crown of England. But to get a general idea of what was happening culturally in Salem Town and Salem Village, you could say that Salem Town was more of the cosmopolitan region. Now, yes, both of these areas were predominantly Protestant and Puritan. So when I say cosmopolitan, I don't mean cosmopolitan that we mean today. But, however, they were more liberal in their lifestyle than the people of Salem Village. It was almost like Salem Town was the city and Salem Village was would be what we would call the suburbs. And again, if we're looking at the official narrative of the Salem witch trials, we're looking at a family rivalry between a family called the Putnams and a family called the Porters. Now, not that it really matters, but I just want to say that if I lived in Salem and if this narrative is true, I definitely would want to hang out with the Porters. The Putnams can kiss my ass. Now, again, as I said in the beginning, these were two families both alike in dignity. The Putnams were one of the largest families in Salem. The Porters were one of the richest families in Salem. Now, at one point, the Putnams and the Porters were pretty evenly matched when it came to their economic and financial well-being. However, the Putnams continued to focus strictly on farming, which ended up dwindling their money, whereas the Porters got into trading. The Porter family developed more of an interest in getting into international business. They even started doing business down in the Caribbean. And as time continued to go on, the Putnams got poor as the Porters got richer. The recorded knowledge of the rivalry between the Putnams and the Porters started in 1672. In 1672, a dam and a sawmill that was run by the Porters flooded out some of the Putnams' land. This resulted in a lawsuit between the Putnams and the Porters. A few years later, the Putnams decided to move outside of Salem Town into what they called Salem Village. The Putnams wanted to get away from the more liberal and cosmopolitan life of Salem Town and keep their family more within the Puritan views. They proceeded to petition to grant the town of Salem Village its own independence, its own government its own rules and regulations. And it was the Porter family, again, one of the richest families in the town who opposed them. And as we know, money talks. Why did they oppose this? Probably because of the lawsuits. Petty is as petty does. However, the real crux of the family issues started to come to a head in 1689. At this time, a new reverend named Samuel Paris arrived in Salem. Now, there is a little bit more complexity when it came to the laws of the town involving the church with a theocracy that was existing at this time in the colonies. I've made a decision not to get too into that here on this channel for this story because of what we're going to talk about in part two. However, I am going to put a link to another video that goes into deeper conversation about these laws if you care to learn more about them. Now, once Reverend Paris was in town, a committee was established to figure out how much money this preacher man would be paid a year. This committee consisted of 26 villagers, 11 of whom were Putnams. This now, committee it? voted to give the Reverend a salary, a barn, and two acres of land. But this decision ended up pissing off a lot of the residents of Salem Town. Now, once again, Salem Village has tried to separate itself from Salem Town. However, with the power of the Porters, they have not been able to establish themselves as a separate entity. So the desires that the Putnams had to have a very strict reverend come in to pay him well, to help monitor their little Salem village, was having to go under the jurisdiction of Salem Town. And so, of course, the more cosmopolitan people of Salem Town, including the Porters, were not very happy with this decision. They did not want taxes to be raised that much to pay for this reverend. 
And the battle over how much the Reverend would be paid came to a head in October of 1691. In 1691, people who were on the committee who voted to give the Reverend this cushy salary and this land and this barn were basically excused from duty, particularly the committee members who were themselves Putnam's or committee members who supported the Putnams. These committee members were replaced with people who were a little bit more hostile to the idea of giving the Reverend this much money, mainly Porter family members and people in the town who supported the Porters. Now I'm gonna be logical about this. The Porters, again, were an extremely wealthy family. And because they were an extremely wealthy family who worked in trading and commercial international business, they were able to employ a lot of people, more people than the Putnams could ever employ. And so, of course, this is going to garner more support. You don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. I also want to believe, if this narrative is true, that majority of people in Salem town maybe saw, saw the ridiculousness of this pious life of, of the Puritans that the Putnams were pushing for. Maybe just maybe they were a little bit more relaxed in their views on God and the way the church should govern the town. But nonetheless, once the new committee was formed, they decided to vote down the taxes that were being used to pay the reverend. So not only has this pissed the Putnams off, but it's also pissed off the reverend. It all started three months later in February of 1692. Reverend Paris had come home from giving a sermon at the church to find three little girls. One was his daughter, nine-year-old Elizabeth. The other was his niece, 11-year-old Abigail, who was under his care since her parents had passed away. And another was their 12-year-old friend, a little girl named Anne Putnam. Now, the reverend came in to find these little girls sitting around the kitchen table with their maid, Tichuba. Their maid, Tichuba, was a native who allegedly was teaching the little girls how to fortune tell. Something pretty innocent. They were trying to figure out who their future husband was going to be. And girls, I can relate. I think I'm still a, as much of a hopeless romantic at 39 years old than I was at 15 years old. So... If I was living in those days, I would absolutely be, be, be asking Tichuba to teach me how to tell fortune on who my future husband was going to be. This information about Tichuba will also be explored later on in part two. Now, I also can imagine that growing up, the reverend's daughter, a Puritan reverend's daughter and a Puritan reverend's niece and the daughter of the Putnam's was probably pretty traumatic. From what I know about the Puritan faith, they definitely, definitely were more like our fundamentalists today, where you probably were beaten for a lot of just purely innocent things that people do. And so I can imagine that the next response from the little girls was maybe a traumatic response in order to try to protect themselves. Because when the father walked in and saw them learning how to do these fortune telling things with Tichuba, they started to act like they had been bewitched by magic. They knew they were in trouble. And so what better way to get out of trouble than to pretend to be afflicted by the devil. The girls pretended like they could not see or speak or hear, and they began thrashing their bodies around as if some unseen force had possessed them. When the girls came to, they claimed that not only, you know, were they learning these fortune-telling tricks from Tichuba, but that they had been visited by apparitions of fellow citizens of Salem, almost like we could say astral projecting, like these women and men of Salem that were going to be accused of being witches were leaving their bodies and coming to fuck around with these little girls. The little girls were taken to Dr. William Griggs, who was the village physician. He examined the little girls and stated that, yes, they were most likely possessed by witchcraft. Now, if this whole narrative is to be believed, this is my opinion on what happened. We have this rivalry between these two families, again, the Porters and the Putmans. The Putmans have brought in this very strict Puritan reverend. Now, my opinion on strict pastors 
preacher's reverence is that deep down they are psychotic narcissists and they are using whatever they can to control, abuse, and hurt people. Now, another thing about a psychotic narcissist is that they think that they are above the law. So when the porters who were more hostile towards both the Putnams and the Reverend pulled away the Reverend's funding from taxing of the people, the Reverend had a target on the porter's back. And we already know the Putnams have had a target on their back. And so when his little girls, little girls who obviously were trying everything they could to not get in trouble for fucking around with fortune telling, went into their episode, it seems to me that the reverend decided to use this as ammunition against the porters. In my opinion, I believe that the reverend knew full well that these little girls were making this shit up. And the doctor, depending on the village for work, was not going to go against the good reverend and the Putnams. Now, in this video, I'm not going to go through the details of all the court cases, because again, we're going to get more into that in part two when we try to unravel the truth of what really happened. However, from what I understand, all the laws and regulations about accusing someone of witchcraft went out the window when it came to this trial. From what I understand, before this happened, if someone was going to accuse someone of being a witch, there was a very serious protocol to follow. One being that the person doing the accusing had to basically put up a bond, put up money. And on top of that, had to provide hardcore evidence to the court before an arrest could be made. If the evidence was not seen as good enough to file charges against someone, then the money they put up as a bond was then confiscated by the court. So with this type of regulation, before this happened, not many people were going around screaming witch because if they did, they could have lost money that they themselves put up as a bond and this whole episode became a game of he said, she said. The testimony relying on a group of prepubescent teenage girls. Now, as I said in the beginning, people from all over the colony allegedly traveled in to watch this trial. And I can imagine it was probably pretty entertaining to watch. You had girls sitting in the audience of the courtroom, passing out, pointing fingers at people, claiming they were being bewitched with no hardcore evidence to show. It's like whatever these girls said went. If the girl said someone was a witch, you best believe that person was going to get arrested. In fact, eight members of the Putnam family were involved in the prosecution. And Anne Putnam, the 12-year-old from the very beginning, she gave testimony on 48 people. When the fiasco started, the Porter family did try to stop the nonsense. They saw it for what it was. They put their neck on the line to try to draw a halt to the basically the murder of all these innocent people. But in doing so, 19 of their allies and family members were also accused of witchcraft. The whole fiasco went on from June of 1692 to September of 1692. In September of 1692, the last execution happened. And trust me, I do believe there would have been more. Except at this point, the governor of Massachusetts, a man named William Phipps, stepped in. He dissolved the tribunals. And by the spring of 1693, sent all the other jailed witches home. The youngest person to be jailed as an accused witch was five years old. Now, as I said in the beginning, in many circles, this is considered to be one of the largest government cover-ups. And again, at this point, the United States didn't even exist. We were still a colony of the United Kingdom, according to the official narrative. A lot of books written about the trials were burned, and for a short period of time, it couldn't be talked about. The only written account we have of what happened is from a man named Cotton Mathers, which means that Cotton Mathers' notes on the trial are the only official narrative available. Now, do I believe this official narrative? Nope, I don't. Maybe some of the people did exist, and maybe they were involved in the executions. But after visiting Salem, Massachusetts for myself, I now believe that nothing happened there. If you're from the South and you've visited cities like Charleston or Savannah or St. Augustine or New Orleans, you know what a true historical city looks like. Salem is not that. If you go to a historical city, most of the time you can touch the graves. 
Here in the South, people still leave candles and marbles and toys on graves from the 1600s for children that once lived. But in Salem, you can't get close to the graves. There's someone there to guard that and make sure you don't touch them. It's also interesting to me that we don't know where the hangings happened in Salem. They say it's at Gallows Hill. And now allegedly Gallows Hill is a recreational park and there's like a little plaque there. But we know for damn certain if something actually happened there, that it would be marked off as a historical site. We also know the story of the Native Americans isn't true. We know that here on this continent were people of all races when this so-called settlement happened. So what do I think happened? I do believe there were witch trials. I do think they happened somewhere. I do believe they happened somewhere here on this continent. I just don't think they happened in Salem. But I do think that the controllers are trying to harness energy in Salem. After all, the police force has a witch logos and the elementary school and other sporting activities and recreational apartments use witchery as their mascot. We know that the city makes money off of this, harnesses that energy. Shows like Hocus Pocus have been created, which also give you a look in the, into the Necronomicon, which was a book we covered a while ago. But it didn't happen there. In my opinion, these witch trials happened further south, where the real Egypt is. In my opinion, the people who were executed as witches all over the world were the high priest and priestesses of Tartaria, the high priest and priestesses of Isis, the ones who used herbs to heal people, God's medicine. In my opinion, what happened in the Salem witch trial is something called catastrophia, which we're going to speak about in part two. A narrative was created, a narrative that still exists today, a narrative that set us up for the great fall of 2020. But until part two, I will leave you with this. There never was a story of such woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. 